Well, hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday to you. Here we are midweek, week five, and you guys are doing great. Um, uh, almost done, and we've got a lovely holiday coming up very soon here, so lots of good things to look forward to. I enjoyed reading your essential questions. Um, please make sure that you look over the post that I put in announcements, uh, just with a reminder checklist of, you know, what we should be seeing in essential questions, and then, you know, go ahead and revise as needed based on that criteria. Area. Remember that you want essential, essential questions, whether they're primary grades or secondary grades, you want it to be a question that cannot be answered yes or no. It has to be thought about, it has to be turned over and over, it has to be justified, it has to be studied, and sometimes it's just going to be an argument between two sides that's not going to be resolved. But that's the point. We want to get them thinking and really thinking and understanding that things aren't as easy as yes or no uh, when they are in real world. So continue on with your essential question work. And then this week, and I'm going to be very short in this video because I talked like 25 minutes the last time, but um, uh, this week you're working on backwards design. And some of you are already doing backwards design. Some of you are very familiar with it. That's my neighbor's dog, Daisy. You might hear her every now and then. She's very noisy. She's just a year old. And she's a Doberman. So let me close the door. Hang on. I walk Daisy. I walk Daisy. And so whenever she hears me talking, she starts barking. So... <coughs> Anyway, so I am back. Um, so in backwards design, uh, you are considering what you want your students to learn before you even begin your lesson, okay? Like I said, some of you are already doing this. Some of you have been doing this for years and it just hasn't been called backward design. It's just been something that you've been doing. Um, some of you may be in a district where you've heard of learning targets. Learning targets are very popular right now um, in elementary school. You know, the I can statements uh, in the secondary grades, um, they oftentimes want something a little bit more detailed, but I think I can statements are fine for both. And so it's basically when you do one of your lovely lessons, and we all have favorite lessons. Um, it's making sure that you have the end goal in mind, not that you're just presenting all of these facts and all of these things and all of this instruction and the kids are doing activities, but they are doing their activities with the idea of what the end point is. And sometimes, you know, when, when people are teaching things, it's easier for them to see that end point. If uh, my husband and I are teaching one of the kids to work on the cars, then they know that we're going to, if we're doing like breaks, they know what steps we're going to do and that the end result is that, you know, I can get the brakes operating on the car again. I can change the rotors or I can change the brake pads. Um, so you have to figure out, and I mean, and that's very simplistic what I just said, but I'm just saying that it's like learning a song. You know, if you're learning chord progressions, you know that your learning target is to be able to complete those progressions and then hopefully be able to play a song. So we have to do the same thing when we're considering this in English, math, science, any any of the classes, we have to consider what's the end point. And then once we have that end point, that idea of what what's the learning target, what's the thing that we want them to learn, what's the big picture we want them to get out of this, then we decide, then we go back and start planning based on what we want. Okay. So it's, it's almost like it's looking at your summative and then going back through your formative instead of going through your formative and then ending with summative. And, um, so that's how you want to look at it. So if, if I'm doing a lesson on John Adams and the founding fathers, what do I want them to get out of it? There's a lot of really cool information about John Adams. There's a lot of really cool information about Abigail Adams. And yes, I want them to be passionate and I want them to love what I love and I want them to have this sense of history. But what, what am I trying to get them to understand? Is it the role of government? Is it government's responsibility to its citizens? 
Um, so once you figure out what that big idea is or big misconception or big whatever, okay, then you're going to decide, okay, this is what I'm looking at. And I'm going to go back through my instruction and I'm going to make sure that my instruction hits everything related to that big idea. And so that's the idea of backwards design. And, um, you know, it, it's good teaching. It's good teaching to be looking at those things anyways, because the fact of the matter is, is that everybody can get information wrong when they're learning it the first time, when they're reading it the first time, myself included, you as well. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had misunderstandings with people, my my spouse, whatever, about learning something and thinking I really understand what's being taught and realizing that I'm getting it wrong. So the cool thing about backward design is it helps that. So just, just a couple quick thoughts, because like I said, I don't want to keep you too long. Summary of backward design. Model for designing instructional materials where the instructor or designer begins the design process with a focus on the desired role, results, the outcome of instruction. The designer then identifies what types of evidence are sufficient proof of the desired end result. Okay, so that's, that's as simple as I can make it right there. Remember that step one is start with a focus on the big ideas in a curricular unit. Step two, once the central focus of the unit has been clearly articulated, formulate perhaps one or two clearly worded statements to represent what exactly you want students to understand about these big ideas. And then three, the next element of backward design is determine how you will assess whether the students truly understood the big ideas of the unit. How can the students demonstrate or apply their understanding so that it's evident that they internalize the key ideas and have relinquished misconceptions or misunderstandings they may have brought to their learning? And, you know, when you have uh, people come in your room to observe you, this is what they are hoping to see. You know, when they come in, they want to see the essential question on the board or the learning target, not just the agenda. They want to know and they want to be able to walk up to a student. And if I'm teaching something like Catcher in the Rye and I have something on the board that says I can um, identify three major themes in Catcher in the Rye, then anybody in that room should be able to if they've been listening, if they've been learning, if I've been working with my backwards design and using my goals or my learning targets, anybody in that room should be able to turn to whoever's observing and say, freedom, fear, individuality, you know, what, whatever we've talked about, okay? And they should have a clear understanding. I'm, I'm learning this, and this is the goal of today's lesson, and this is how I'm going to be able to show. It may be oral. It may be through collaborative conversation. It may th be through multimedia. It may be through an arts-based project or a standardized test. But however they're going to show it, they should be able to show it. Okay? So I want you to have a wonderful work week and um, continue working on backwards design. And I will look forward to reading more of your discussion boards and work this Sunday. Take care. Bye-bye.